I'm Steve Salop, and I want to give this pre-panel talk on potential competition and antitrust analysis. I really want to talk about three types of anti-competitive conduct directed at uh, eliminating competition from potential and nascent competitors, acquisitions, exclusion, and agreements. I've got really two main themes for the talk today. One is a general legal recommendation that courts and regulators should adopt anti-competitive presumptions for these alleged conducts. And the reason why I've got this presumption, the main reason is that monopoly profits exceed duopoly profits to the detriment of consumers. I wanna start by talking a little bit about barriers to entry. Um, the, the, the analysis of barriers to entry, I think is pretty well known at this point. Uh, Entry barriers are impediments to entry that permit a dominant firm to exercise market power to the detriment of consumers. It's got nothing to do with whether the entrant is equally efficient as the dominant firm. Instead, the focus is on whether entry can prevent any competitive conduct. And there, there are five main reasons why uh, ent entry may, may not succeed. One is that there are delays of entry. Uh, second, that entrants may face cost or demand disadvantages. Third, that the interest may have large economies of scale that would make it difficult for them to achieve minimum viable scale. Fourth, that they've got some costs and the sunk costs in conjunction with post-entry price competition could be a barrier. Now, this may be a little surprising. I mean, why would competition be a barrier to entry? But the idea is that the anticipation of post-entry competition could be a barrier when there's significant economies of scale and sunk costs. That's because the entrant may fear that it will not achieve minimum viable scale. And if it does so, it'll lose its some costs and that can be a deterrent to enter. Well, what's tricky about this? What's tricky is that the entrant may be viable at the monopoly price, but the entrant may properly anticipate that if it enters, there'll be post-entry price competition. And that post-entry price competition could be pretty intense, particularly if the products are, are, are quite homogeneous and it can create a price war, what I, what I call a death spiral, uh, where, the, where the equilibrium of the market is that the entrant ends up losing money. And anticipating this, fearing this, the entrant decides not to enter. Of course, if it doesn't enter, then the monopolist can continue to exercise uh, its monopoly power. And that's why post-entry competition can be a barrier to entry. Now I want to turn to the three types of anti-competitive conduct. The first are anti-competitive acquisitions. I think it's important to note that this doesn't just concern horizontal acquisitions, but also vertical or complementary product competitors, because they can partner up with, uh, with the competitors of the dominant firm, or maybe in the future, they could enter the dominant firm's market by themselves. Um, in the U.S., at least, the, the barrier that the, excuse me, the legal standard uh, facing uh, the government with respect to bringing actions for these kinds of mergers is very high. And it makes it very difficult for, for the agencies to win. In fact, Facebook, Instagram, which is now a case being brought by the FTC, uh, they, they may not win that case. Uh, the, the law is just sets a very high rebuttal burden uh, on, on the uh, on the government. And I think that should be reversed. I, I think there should be an anti-competitive presumption with a high rebuttal burden on the parties. Why? Uh, because false negatives uh, are much more concerning than false positives. There are several reasons for that, uh, that that I've listed here. First of all, you, you have to have entry, entry by independent competitors or else you can't have market self-correction. Uh, if you have a monopoly, the way to correct the monopoly is to have to have entry, but if the monopolist can just take out the competitors, then you're you're never going to be able to correct the monopoly. Secondly, I don't th the idea that the entrants need the ability to sell out to the dominant firms in order to get them to enter to begin with. I think that's just not correct. The appropriate but for a world is not that the entrant remains a standalone competitor, rather it's that the entrant finds an alternative purchaser that raises fewer competitive concerns. In fact. Uh, raises competitive benefits. I think that I think that's a much better but for world. There, there usually are alternatives. Uh, the alternative acquirer can attain the efficiencies, so it's not as if the efficiencies are going to be lost. The alternative acquirer can buy the entrance, so the idea that the entrant has an entry for buyout strategy, that's still going to be viable. 
the dominant firm could achieve the efficiencies by its own investments. So I, I, I don't think you need to allow the incumbent dominant firm to buy the entry in order to get, get that innovation. Now, it's often said, well, wait a minute, the dominant firm's going to bid higher for the entrant, so it must be worth more to him, and we should let the dominant firm win. But that's just not right. Why? The reason why the dominant firm can bid more is that monopoly profits exceed duopoly profits. Let me show you this with, with a, a little short. Uh, here, I'm, I'm setting out that there are two acquirers, a dominant firm and a rival acquirer. And the idea is that if the dominant firm wins the bidding for the potential entrant, it's going to maintain its monopoly profits, and the rival acquirer is only going to earn a small level of profits. On the other hand, if the rival acquirer gets to out, gets to uh, buy the buy the startup entrant, it'll earn profits of sixty. It'll gain profits of, of forty, and the dominant firm, however, its profits will fall from the monopoly level down to the duopoly level. Now, what I've set out here, if, if, you, if, if you look at the, at the bids, the dominant firm is willing to bid up to 100. Why? Well, its profits are going to fall from 200 to 100. It's willing to pay 100 in order to preserve its monopoly profits. By contrast, the rival is only willing to bid up to 40, which is the increase in the profits that it will achieve. Well, under these circumstances, the dominant firm's got a huge bidding advantage, it, it should be able to make the acquisition of something like 41. Okay? But if it does that, then we're going to preserve monopoly profits. Consumers are going to lose out from the benefit of competition. Okay, so why is the dominant firm able to bid more? Well, basically, it's because the combined profits of the two firms are higher under monopoly than they are under duopoly. In fact, you could change these numbers any way you wish. And you're still going to find that the dominant firm will outbid the acquirer as long as the uh, total profits for under competition are less than the total profits with the monopolist. For example, suppose you you lower this that, that they're, it's equal that they're equal, 80 and 80. Well, still now the dominant firm is willing to bid up to 120. Uh, it's willing to bid more, not less. The rival acquirer is willing to bid more, 60 rather than 40, but it's not enough. Any combination of numbers that leads to total profits of less than 220 is going to lead the dominant firm to win the bidding. Monopoly profits exceed duopoly profits, gives the dominant firm the bidding advantage to preserve its monopoly power. Okay, well, that same idea is going to apply to, to anti-competitive acquisitions, of, uh, of, of inputs that lead to exclusion or anti-competitive agreements between the dominant firm and, uh, and the nascent competitor. Okay, well, let, let's talk about exclusion first. Dominant firms want to prevent entry that would lead to lower prices. The dominant firm is not attempting to achieve monopoly power, already has monopoly power. Instead, it's trying to preserve its monopoly power to prevent prices from falling. Something that I call in my, in my articles, price down cases. Now in that regard, the efficient, equally efficient competitor test is defective because entry even by less efficient competitors can increase competition, cause prices to fall and benefit consumers. Uh, but at the same time, if they get into a bidding war for critical inputs, the dominant firm excludes by getting control of critical inputs, it's going to be able to outbid the potential entrant or the nascent competitor for those scarce inputs. Why? Because monopoly profits exceed duopoly profits. And for, this, for all these reasons, we should adopt an anti-competitor presumption rather than making it harder uh, for the entrant to, to win the case or for the government to win the case. Okay, why, do monopoly pro why does the idea that monopoly profits exceed duopoly profits imply uh, the bidding advantage for the incumbent here? Same reason. So here I'm talking about profits by uh, purchasing a scarce input. We've got two bidders, the dominant firm and a, and a rival bidder. Again, if the rival wins, combined profits uh, in the duopoly are going to be lower than monopoly profits if the dominant firm wins. That's going to lead the dominant firm to have an inherent advantage in bidding. And as a result, it's going to acquire the scarce input. 
that's going to raise barriers to entry to the entrant. Uh, it will preserve its monopoly power and consumers will lose the benefit of the competition. Now, I'm not saying that monopoly profits always e exceed duopoly profits. If the entrant's got much lower costs, if the entrant's product has got a differentiated product that is quite, quite different from the dominant firm, then duopoly profits can, can be higher. But the normal case, the normal case we normally talk about in antitrust is where the dominant firm uh, has a bidding advantage because monopoly profits exceed the combined duopoly profits. Okay, what about anti-competitive agreements? Well, here you've got the same issue. Because monopoly profits exceed duopoly profits, the parties have a mutual incentive to strike an anti-competitive non-competition agreement. That is an agreement that uh, re eliminates or reduces the competition from the entrant and allows for continued monopoly conduct. That continued monopoly profit gives them a mutual incentive to agree because they can share the monopoly profits. And that benefits both parties at the expense of consumers. Uh, same idea as on the previous two, uh, the previous two charts. I'm not going to reproduce it here. What's interesting is in the US where private litigation is very important, is that the parties can settle private litigation in order to share the monopoly profits. It's, it would be quite unusual for for uh, a rival to ever actually win a monopolization case at trial. Why? Because if it's likely to win, then the dominant firm can pay, can pay the rival more money to go away than to win a case. Because if it wins, the monopoly profits are going to be destroyed and there's going to be less profits for the two of them. So it's in their mutual interest to have a settlement that preserves the ability for the monopolist to continue to engage in, uh, in the monopoly conduct. And so what, I, what, what I've recommended in the US and what I recommend in the, in the EU is that you should prohibit private settlements that allow the continuation of the anti-competitive conduct in exchange for cash or other consideration paid to the plaintiff to go away and thereby and permit the continued uh, either either go away or 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 permit the continued uh, anti-competitive conduct. So thank you very much. Uh, that's what I have to say. I'm I'm looking forward to our session in June. Thank you.